It's not my fault. It really is not. It was the guy earlier. He, he was doing that. <clears throat> okay, hey, he's closing the door, so that was it. You can't get in or out. Welcome to my talk. It's already the second day of Vox Days Bucharest. Um, I think you can guess who I work for. Great company. Hey, you leave. Um, so, yes, most important question. And um, I already talked to a bunch of people yesterday, and I know kind of the answer already, but I'll ask anyway. So who in this room has a Twitter account and is actually using it? Ah, hands went down. What is this? So I know that you guys love your Facebook in this country, but it's the wrong medium for IT stuff, right? All the IT stuff actually is happening on Twitter. If, you know, all the international speakers that come here, they, they are all on Twitter and they communicate on Twitter. You could ask them questions and they reply immediately, so you're using the wrong medium. Um, you should also be tweeting about all the other talks that you've been seeing so that other people in Bucharest and Romania know how cool this event is and then they're coming next year. So tweet about it. Tweet about my talk, please. And if you do, add that hashtag TwitterVM team because Twitter has a VM team. And it's not so small anymore. We are now eight people already. And we have three GC engineers. And you know everyone has GC issues, so they are taking care of that. Um, then I'm the compiler engineer, so I do the fun stuff. Um, and then I travel around and talk about the fun stuff. That's what I do. There's another colleague of mine. His name is Flavio. He's, he's also working on, a, on the compiler now and doing a bunch of uh, Scala-specific optimizations in Graal. And then we have other people working on different things, uh, testing infrastructure stuff. And, and then we have one of my colleagues is working on a tool called Autotune. And Autotune is basically what I'm talking about today. All right? So tweet about everything. And, and don't use Facebook or Instagram. I heard you guys love Instagram. Don't use that. So about me a little bit, if you don't know me, uh, I worked for a very long time on JVMs. And more than 14 years now. And basically, all these 14 years, I was working on JIT compilers. Okay. I'll ask you a bunch of questions so we're all on the same page. People know what a JVM is, right? I, don't, I think I'm assuming yes. OK, good. You know Hotspot? Yes, Hotspot is the JVM of OpenJDK. Do people know what a JIT compiler is? All right, so OK, we kind of have to explain that a little bit quickly. So a JIT compiler is the compiler in the JVM that takes Java bytecode and compiles it while you run your application just in time into native code so that your application runs faster. It's very different to an AOT compiler, let's say like GCC, where you statically compile C++ into an executable. We take the Java bytecode and compile it while we run. And it has a bunch of advantages. Um, I'm not going too much into detail here, but um, it's a very good way to produce very fast code. So I was working on this stuff for a very long time. I worked at Sun and Oracle in the Hotspot compiler team. And I was basically, uh, when I was in the Hotspot compil compiler team, mostly working on C2. Okay? Do people know what C1 and C2 are? All right. So Hotspot has two JIT compilers. You guys know what a JIT compiler is? Yes. Should I ask again? All hands should go up. There's, there are two. It's, one is called C1 or client compiler, and the other one is called C2 or server compiler. You might remember the dash client, dash server thingy. That's kind of that. Uh, so there are two different compilers. C1 is a high throughput compiler. So its purpose is to compile code quickly. It doesn't do a lot of optimizations, but we want to get away from interpreting bytecode, which is really slow, to native code. That's the purpose of C1. And then C1 compiles code in a way that we are collecting profiling data. And then we recompile with C2, which is a peak performance compiler and does a lot of optimizations. You know, way more inlining, escape analysis, loop unrolling, auto vectorization, all that stuff. I'm not explaining this. You can read up on that if, on Wikipedia if you want. Um, and then I'll ask the, yeah, because we need it later too. Do people know what tiered compilation is? No? OK. So I just explained we interpret code, and then we compile with C1, right? And there are actually four tier levels in Hotspot. I, IBM's J9 has something like this as well, similar. So a lot of JVMs do that. 
They have multiple stages of compilation, and Hotspot has four. And tier one, two, three are all C1 levels. So it's different versions of code that C1 compiles. And, it, and the different versions are different in how much profiling data they collect. And the profiling data is then used to recompile code on the tier four level, which is C2. And that gives you the peak performance code. Yeah, we got that. Should I ask again? Do people know what tier compilation is? No. All right. <clears throat> so these three projects were kind of the biggest things that I worked on at Sun Oracle. I worked on JSR 292, Invoke Dynamic. You might know that. Uh, method handles, if you have ever used it. Um, there were two implementations that we did. One was a lot of handwritten assembly code in the JVM. Very painful, uh, very hard to port, and we had a, a performance issue. So we redesigned everything and moved a lot of the logic that was in the JVM into Java, into a package called Java Lang Invoke. And I wrote a bunch of that Java Lang Invoke code in the core library. So if it doesn't work, you could technically blame me. But I always like to say my code was perfectly fine, and the people who touched it after me broke it. And that's the truth. You can tweet that out. Uh, then I worked on Chap 243, the Java level JVM compiler interface. And we introduced that in, in JDK 9. It's also called JVM CI. It's basically we took the interface that Graal was using and stripped it out and made it an API. That's really all we did, because we wanted and it's not an official API, but it, it's kind of stable-ish. We wanted an API in OpenJDK so that we could plug in external compilers. And Graal is one of People know what Graal is, right? I don't, yeah. I think I'll, I'll have a slide later. Um, and then also in JDK 9, and that was the reason why, why we introduced JVMCI, we, uh, we introduced a feature ahead of time compilation. I'm not sure even. I don't think a lot of people know about this, actually. It's not native image. It's not the Graal VM stuff. It's something else. It's basically a small command line utility that acts as an AOT compiler where it, you, know, you pass in class files or a char file or something like this, and then it sends off a compilations to Graal, compiles it, and spits out a shared library at the other end. And then Hotspot can pick up these shared libraries automatically, and it can help startup. So if you have a problem with startup, takes a very long time to start up, that might help. And now I work at Twitter. It's the greatest company on the planet. And you guys don't even know because you're not using it. This is Twitter. That's what it looks like. We have hundreds of services, thousands of instances of these services, and we run on heterogeneous hardware, like most people do, right? If you run, we have our own data centers, and and not all the machines are the same, and you run somewhere in the cloud, you don't even know what you're running on. So it's all different hardware. So a big issue is performance optimization in, in this scenario. Uh, hand tuning doesn't scale, right? Every one of you probably hand tuned the JVM with something at some point, and it's, it usually goes that way. You're, you're kind of annoyed a little bit with the performance, and you say, fuck it, I'll just do it now. Is this being recorded? Yeah, OK, I have to be careful what I say. Um, uh, damn it, uh, I don't like the performance. <laughs> yeah. So, and then you sit down and tune a little bit, right? And that happens in, like in regular five, three to five year. You know, you're not doing it all the time. You do it when you're annoyed, and then, then you forget about it. And then you leave the company, and you, you know. So you can only do a few parameters manually because you have to kind of you know, build a model up in your head and understand what's going on. And then it's very time consuming, labor intense, error prone. You can, you're just human. You make a lot of mistakes. And upgrades make optimality fleeting. That's very important because a lot of you know, this whole agile thing and, and whatnot and redeploying multiple times a day shit. We at Twitter, we also have services that we deploy multiple times a week. That means the code is changing all the time. It's not changing dramatically, but it's changing all the time. Right? So if I tune today, next week, it's not tuned anymore for that code base. So many services operate below optimality. And that's certainly true for Twitter. So we are throwing out a lot of money out of the window because it's not running optimal. Right? We could use less machines for the stuff that we are doing if we would, if we would tune it. 
So this, this is kind of a, a theoretical part of, the, of my talk, which I don't understand too well, but I, I think it's important that you also understand it not too well, because I'm explaining it to you. So, but, but performance tuning in general, you have a function defined over domain x, and then what you want to do is find a configuration that maximizes f, whatever f is, right? Throughput, memory usage, CPU utilization, I don't know, something. And then, very important, it's always subject to a constraint or multiple constraints. The number one constraint is it still has to work, right? And we'll see that later when I show you the experiments that I did, that sometimes you can tune too far and it's not working anymore. So this is performance tuning, right? You pick a parameter, you run an instance, and then you measure it, and then you, the, the human, the performance engineer, needs to look at the result and say, OK, this was actually better or this was worse, and then now I have to tune that parameter in that direction. What we really want is get rid of the performance engineer and have a black box. We don't, we don't even need to know what it is, right? It just has to make a decision what to try next. And this black box function, what we are using is a machine learning technique. It's called Bayesian optimization. And Bayesian optimization is really nice because it, it's a method to learn potentially noisy objective functions. That's important because benchmarks and performance measurement is noisy in general. Uh, it's iteratively and efficiently very important because we don't want to wait forever to get a result, right? We want a result pretty soon. Here, finds new optimal few iterations. We'll see that later as well. Works well with nonlinear, multimodal, high-dimensional functions. That's the important one because the JVM has hundreds of parameters you could tune, right? If you just tune one, that's, that's not enough. You need to tune more. So high dimensional, important. If you really want to know how this all works, my colleague Rumpke, he can explain it in a very soothing voice and much better than I do. So he gave two presentations, one at DevOps US, as you can see. Um, and then you see the slides that he has there. I just stole them. That's all I did. And so I'm, I'm going to explain to you now roughly how Bayesian optimization works so that you can understand the graphs and the tables and the numbers we look at later better. <clears throat> so we have a parameter that affects performance. Obviously, it goes from minus 6 to 6. And then higher performance is better. We did three evaluation runs, actual runs. These were the results. And then this is the actual performance curve that we don't know, right? The three points are certainly on the curve, because otherwise the measurement would be, would be wrong. And then what Bayesian optimization does, it has some results, and it just guesses a function with some probability. And the probability is the, the blue area above the curve. And you can see where you actually have results, the probability is basically zero because you have a result. Okay? And then the weight, this is the actual curve. And then what you do, you take a line, basically, with your best result that you have, and then the blue area above the red line is your expected improvement. That's the graph at the bottom, right? And the highest point of your expected improvement, that's where you try next. That's the value of the parameter you try next. And this is what we do. So we try that one, OK? Then we try this one. We try the one on the left. Yeah, nice. Then we try that guy. And so we, we've exploited that space here, right? We have all the points. We know what the best result in that area is. And then we try the one on the right, this guy. Uh, OK, was not that good. Then the one on the very left. OK, that was, not, that was really not good. And so we go through the whole space until we find the optimum. That's basically what Bayesian optimization does for us. It's what we would do as a human as well, but the machine can just do it better. OK. That's really all. So Bayesian optimization is good because non-parametric, robust, extensible bell test and many systems, real-world high-impact problems. We, we need something that actually works, right? So in this one, we know it does, and it will give us a result that's actually valid. Good. That's the more interesting part. So you kind of know now how it works and how the numbers are to interpret. So what is autotune? I call this, you know, the Bayesian optimization thingy a Boaz. 
It's basically because it's a service that's running inside of Twitter in our data center. It's really just one service. And it's based on something called WetLab. We acquired a company at some point. And WetLab is an enhancement of a framework called Spearmint. And Spearmint is actually open source. So WetLab is unfortunately not, and I don't think we can make it open source, but Spearmint still is. It's just not as good as WetLab, but it would still do the same job. And then AutoTune is just a driver to run experiments. So Twitter, we run on Mesos in Aurora, whatever, but could be Kubernetes or Docker, it doesn't even matter. You just need a driver that starts and stops experiments and collects whatever you are looking for, right? It starts with an experiment, runs some stuff, looks at the result, takes it, sends it off to the Bayesian optimization part. The Bayesian optimization does what you just saw and tells Autotune, try this value next. Is that, yeah? It's easy, isn't it? I know. It's very powerful. What is Graal? Java Virtual Machine Just-in-Time Compiler. Everyone in this room should know what that is now. You could actually work on it. We would need some help. Um, it's at, so at this point, I should probably say that I'm not talking about GraalVM. If you came here and you want to hear about GraalVM, it's the wrong talk. GraalVM is, in my opinion, a very unfortunate marketing term. It's an umbrella marketing term for three different technologies. It's for Graal, the Just-in-Time Compiler, that's the thing I'm talking about. That's the thing that Twitter's using. Truffle and Substrate VM, which you might know under native image. And I'm not talking about native image or, or Truffle. Only, only the JIT compiler. Actively developed by Oracle Labs. There's an official OpenJDK project, but most of the work is done on GitHub. Uh, uses JVM CI. We've heard that earlier. And Graal is written in Java. It's not important for this talk, but it's important if you want to try Graal, especially if you, I think my next slide, yes. If you want to try it. So I have a talk, it's called Graal, how to, new, to use the new chick compiler in real life. And the reason I'm doing this talk is Graal is written in Java and C2 is written in C++. They have very different properties in terms of runtime, right? The memory allocation for Graal happens on the Java heap, for C2 it happens on the native malloc heap. It's different. And then at this point in time, we still don't AOT compile Graal, so Graal itself needs to compile itself while you run. That's called bootstrapping. That's something you need to know if you go to work tomorrow. No, what, what is today? Friday. No, Monday. You go to work. You go to work on Monday. And then you try this, and you want to convince your boss, so you have to run some benchmarks, right? Watch this talk first before you run benchmarks, so you, you can interpret the benchmark numbers you get more, more easily. Good. So, which parameters did I tune? I picked three, and I picked three inlining-related parameters. And the reason for this is most of our services are written in Scala, and inlining is the mother of all optimizations. So inlining enables other optimizations to perform better, especially escape analysis. So if you inline more, you can get rid of more temporary object allocations. And that we'll see that reduces latency and stuff. We'll see that later. So there's one called trivial inlining size, and it's the default value is 10, and that's 10 nodes in the compiler graph. You parse a method into a graph in the compiler, and if that graph has less than 10 nodes, we inline it all the time because it's a very simple method. We don't even mess around with profiling information. We just inline it. The 300, the maximum inlining size, is basically the other end of the spectrum. If it's more than 300, we don't. And then there's one called small compiled low-level graph size. It's similar to the second one, but there are two representations in Graal and also in many other compilers. There is a higher level intermediate representation and the low-level intermediate representation. And the low-level is much closer to actual machine instructions. And so this one looks at that. And so these are the three that I tuned. There's a talk I was doing, Twitter's Quest for Holy Grail Runtime, 
which basically is the story of the first year of me working at Twitter, how we started using Graal, you know, all the bugs we found, I explain all this. One thing I did, and I'm, I'm also showing the improvements that we're seeing by running with Graal. And one, one thing I did was I was doing the thing that I said earlier you shouldn't be doing. I was hand-tuning that stuff. So I sat down on a Friday afternoon for three hours, was looking at a lot of log files, try, you know, was fiddling around with inlining parameters and tried to make it faster. So we're looking here at the tweet service, uh, the tweet service is using parallel GC, so these are scavenge cycles, PS scavenge cycles. We can, it's a little hard to see here, but we can reduce GC cycles by 4.2 by, by just using Graal instead of C2. So we just swap out C2 with Graal without any changes, default settings, 4.2. Hand tuning it, I could squeeze out another 1.5%. You yeah, know, it's nice, it's pretty good. And this is CPU time, so by just switching to Graal, we save 13% of user CPU time, which is huge, right? And then hand fiddling around, I, I got another 2%, which is really nice. I mean, if you've ever worked in the compiler, you know, native compiler area, 2% improvement are good. It's a lot. I mean, 13 is ridiculous, but 2 is a lot. And I was, I was happy. I thought, cool, 2. Nice. But I knew that a computer could do it better. Good. So what I did, this is basically the configuration file of, of Autotune. Um, you see the parameter names. You see what type it is. And you also see that I gave it ranges. It's not necessary to give it ranges, right? I could also say for every parameter, one to one million. doesn't matter, because the Bayesian optimization will figure it out anyway, right? And then we have the constraint. And if we inline too much, it's not working, and then it just kicks it out, and it'll, it'll find the optimum anyway. But the reason why I gave it ranges is because I wanted the experiment to finish in a certain amount of time for presentation purposes, OK? So and I knew you know, the, the trivial inlining size was 10 by default. I knew going lower will probably reduce performance, so we go to, from 10 to 25. Then this one is the other two, uh, default 300, 200, 500. Yeah. Just some reasonable ranges. Test setup, very important. If you have done performance measurements, do it on dedicated machines. Especially when we talk about 2% improvement, it's in the noise. Don't do it in a data center. Don't do it in the cloud. Wasn't yesterday someone talking about doing performance stuff in AWS, and I was just you know, pulling out the hair I don't have. But, um, so dedicated machines. I have dedicated machines. Nothing else is running on them. All instances receive the same exact requests. That's very important, especially for the tweet service. It's not the same number of requests. It's the exact same request, because a tweet could be one character long or 280. Very different memory allocation pattern. So I run this version of JVMCI, this version of Graal. It's already a little bit older. It's just, you know, doesn't really matter. And we run the default tiered C1 Graal setup. Do people know what tiered compilation is? OK. Experiment one, the tweet service. It's, it's my favorite one. Um, it's a Finagle thrift service. And you know, thrift, Finagle is uh, a framework that we open sourced. M and many of our services are built on top of that framework. Uh, it's an extensible RPC system for the JVM used to construct high concurrency service. I have no idea what it's doing, and I don't need to know. To be honest, I cannot even write a Hello World in Scala. I have no clue. Uh, I only speak Java bytecode, to be honest. But the important part at the very uh, left bottom, it's 92% Scala code. And as I said earlier, most of our services are written in Scala. And Scala is a, I always say, a, a dynamic language. It's not, it's not really what I want to say, but it's, you know, you can write very functional style Scala. And that means it's allocating a lot of temporary objects that are not really needed. And Graal has better inlining and better escape analysis implementations than C2. And so Graal is, can optimize color code really, really well. So that's, that's why it's working so good for us. Tweet service. Yes, objective. What do we want? I want user CPU time to be reduced. 
And since, if you remember, Bayesian optimization is looking for maxima, so we just take the inverse, one divided by, yeah. okay, that's all, very simple. Uh, constraints, actually it's only one. Uh, if we ever use this in production, we need more than one constraint. But I knew for my experiments one would be enough, and what I'm looking for is if we're getting throttled in Mesos. That basically means we're not very good citizens, we use too much CPU, something went wrong, and then we get throttled, and that basically means it's not really running. So that's, that's the constraint. And this is one experiment. So I was running the tweet service for 24 hours, and you see one evaluation run is 30 minutes long. It's not very long, um, but I know for the tweet service and for the purpose of, of these experiments that 30 minutes is enough. It starts up quickly enough, it gets to a steady state, pretty much everything's compiled. Um, so I know that. For if, if, I, if we would be doing this for all the services we have, we would certainly run much, much longer because I don't know how the services behave. But I know this service really well, so I did 30-minute runs, and I wanted to be it done in 24 hours. Good. All, you saw it's all, all received the same requests. This is user CPU time, and the blue is experiment, and the orange is control. You see when they restart, they spike, because they, we have to compile a lot of methods. We compile about 40,000 methods for one instance of, of the tweet service. If the blue line is below the orange one, that's an improvement. And this is the result of Autotune. It's basically you get a web page and a table, and the top one is, uh, I can't read it from here, it's like 0.1838%. Or, so that means that we reduced CPU by 8.4% with these parameters. Trivial inline sense was 10, you remember, and the other ones were 300, 300. So that's certainly much higher than that. One thing that people point out is it's all over the place, because the second one is 8.2, and then we have a 6.4, 6.4, but the numbers are very different, especially the first one. It's 21, 15, 21. So it doesn't really need to be a nice picture, right? As long as performance better. Different values of different parameters mean different things get inlined. But if we can find the best result, I don't care what it is. It could be all over the place. Really, I don't. And this is the bottom of the table. And as you can see, three evaluations actually violated the constraint. So we tuned it too far, something went wrong, could be anything, uh, and then it didn't work, we got throttled. One was still running while it, when it was shutting down the whole experiment. And then, this is the table, and you see there's a charts thing at the top. We can look at the charts. Uh, these are all the, ev the ev evaluations that we did, and keep in mind, take, you know, look at this, with a grain of salt, because every result in that table, every data point, depends on two other values that are different, right? because we're constantly tuning them. I would have to run the experiments three more times with just the one to give you like a flat chart, but this is a three-dimensional space we're exploring, so eh, you know. But if you squint a little, you can see it certainly gets better when it gets higher, right? And then we have this one Let's say it's an outlier. It might be an outlier, but it, again, it depends on two other values, so maybe it's not. Then this is um, maximum inlining size. It's kind of flattish. We have these two outliers at, way at the top on the right, so I hope that's actually true. And you don't have to squint for this one. Right? It's very obvious what the hell is going on. So the default one for this guy was 300. It's way too low for, for this particular service, right? And I'm kind of arguing that it's probably too low for all the applications out there. But for this particular one, it's certainly too low. And then what I did <coughs> was I took the top result in the table and ran a verification experiment to actually see if what we see in Autotune we see, let's say, in the real world. So this is like a real type of world thing running what, the best I could do, let's put it this way. It's not really in production, but almost. Um, 24 hours of tweets, uh, C2 is blue, orange growl, and red is growl with the auto-tune result. 
So as we heard earlier, it's using parallel GC, so PS scavenge cycles. At this particular run, we could reduce GC cycles by 3.4%. So we had GC cycles 3.4% less. And this is auto-tune. And it's another 3.5. So up to a total of almost 7%. That's really nice. I'm, I mean, the 3.4 is already great by just you know, turning on a command line flag and running on a different compiler. But then we can tune 2x out of it by just changing a few parameters. So 7% is already nice. It's, it's not you know, huge, but I mean, we still have to do the same work, or we're doing the same work as we did before. And this is the user C No, sorry, it's not. It's the same data uh, in a different graph. It's allocated bytes per tweet. Uh, I just wanted to show you this, um, that it's flat over 24 hours, more or less, right? It still it fluctuates a little bit, because I said different tweet sizes. And it's, but it's the same result, right? 3.5, 3.4, and uh, 7. It's just a different way to represent it. That's the one I'm really looking for, because that's the money. If just by turning on Graal, in this particular run, and you've seen it before, we, we reduce by 12%. It's huge. And then this is Autotune, which gives us another 6.2, which is a total of 18%. So we run the same thing as we did before. We serve the same number of requests as we did before, but we could use 18% less machines to do it which is a lot of money when you have a lot of machines. So unfortunately, I don't get the money that we're saving, but it's a lot. And it's, it's way more than they pay me, which is also annoying. So for the tweet service, I also looked at, at, late, at P99 latencies. Um, I look at two nines, because if you go more than two nines, it's basically your longest GCs that determine your latency. But two nines is basically your real-world response time, and it's 99% of the tweet, so it's pretty much everything anyway. So you can certainly see that Graal's better. It's a little hard to see how much exactly it is. And this is Autotune. It, it's also obvious that it's better, but you know, it's a little overlapping, so hard to read. So what I did was I, um, uh, I integrated over the 24 hours. I basically summed up all the, the latency times so that we get an idea. And this is the result. By just running on Graal instead of C2, P99 latencies are reduced by 20%. And then we tune it, we get another 8, which is 28%. That's huge. That means you get your tweet 28% faster. It's like ridiculous. You can scroll through Twitter. You could read technically 28% more tweets. That would be nice. That would mean more money for me. By the way, have you created Twitter accounts yet? <laughs> so I did a second experiment um, with a service called Social Graph. And it's also a Finagle Thrift service. So from the base, very similar. It's just the logic on top that's different. So this one is an uh, abstraction from managing many-to-many -many relationships at Twitter. It's basically who you follow and who follows you, that type of thing, right? It's, it's a very different, you know, Let's call it business logic, right? And so, but I wanted to see how does that behave, how, how much can do auto-tune for this service. So you know the drill. That's the objective. Same thing we're using for user CPU time, just the name's different, right? Um, same constraint. If we're getting throttled, you know, kill us. And that's the result. So 24 hours of social graph, different days. So that's why the graph looks different. Uh, again, 30-minute evaluation runs, because that service is very similar to the tweet service, and I know it really well. Uh, that's the result. There's certainly some that are better. There are some that are worse. You know, it's all over the place when Bayesian optimization does its thing, and, and this is the result table. So the top is 7.6%, which is very nice. I totally take 7.6. And then we have another 7.6, 7.2, So I would guess maybe we get about a 7% improvement. That would be nice. We'll see in a minute. And again, if you look at the numbers, they're kind of, you know, I don't want to say random, but to some degree they are. And it, it really, it's like 23 and 12, but the improvement is almost the same. It's just 
different things in line which might end up with the same performance. Bottom of the table, one violation. Don't look at the three that are still running. I don't know what that is. It's probably a bug. Um, and here are the charts. It's, it's similar to the tweet service. It's still like it's going up, but not, maybe not as obvious as, as before. This one's kind of flattish again. Interestingly, the, the best result here is at 400, where for the tweet service, it was more than that. Uh, and this one is also going up, but not as clearly as for the tweet service. So it's certainly, again, default is 300, and the best one is 649, I think, or whatever it is. So I'm arguing that the ranges I gave for this particular one was not enough. So maybe the 1 to 1,000 or 10,000 thing doing that, it would get a better result actually for this one. Good. Verification experiment. Same thing. Blue, orange, red. Social graph. Social graph is using CMS. So we are looking at parallel news cycles. Uh, and the improvement we get for this service by switching to Graal is only 1.6%. You know, it's just, it's just different code. It, it's written differently. Diff diff the problem with Scala is, is you, you can write it in pure FP style and then to, in a style that's very similar to Java. Let's call it this way. And depending on which style you choose, the memory allocation patterns are very different. So 1.6, this is autotune. And the cool thing about this result is 1.6 is nice, but we can get m twice as much out of it if we tune it. Right? Up to a total of five. And with TweetyPy, it was seven. So, I mean, five is already pretty good. And then user CPU time, we can only reduce it by 5.5. Uh, the tweet service was 12. So, again, very different code. And this is the autotune result, 7.8. So, again, for this service, autotune does a really, really good job of optimizing it. The default values for Graal were not just good enough, but here we get more out of, of Graal with Autotune than we get by just switching to it up to 13. It's nice. I take 13. Again, a lot of money. The interesting um, point in this graph, and I don't know the answer. I haven't had time yet to, to go back and look at it. But if you look at the, the blue and the orange one, they're kind of the improvement is the same, the, and it's independent of the load. But the, the red one, when the load's low, is less than when the load's high. That's very interesting. And I'm really not exactly sure why that's happening. And the 7.8 is where the load is high. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, I want to look good on stage. And the second reason is it really only matters when the load is high. Because you, s you scale your instance size to the highest load you have. right? So it doesn't really matter that the bottom doesn't improve that much. It's the high load that's important. Questions? There is probably, I'm not sure, there's one guy who wants to ask a question, and some people, two guys, and some people might think the question, but they don't want to ask it. Was that the question? No? Well, of course I did. I could not come up here and then talk about Graal all the time and say, oh, it's so great, and Autotune does a such a great job. Of course I did at C2 Run as well, just to verify what can do Autotune for another compiler for C2, the one that you're all using today, and what are the results? So I picked three C2 parameters that are similar to the ones that are tuned for Graal. There's one called max inline level, and Graal doesn't have that. It's basically how deep you inline, how many levels of calls you inline, which is very important because the default value of hotspot today is nine which is not a lot. And today, everyone's using a trillion of frameworks, and frameworks call frameworks and frame call, 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 call. But at 9, it stops, right? So you might not end up inlining everything that you really wanted to call. Then there's one called max inline size. It's pretty much the one that we saw earlier. 35, the difference is 35 is bytecode size. It's not nodes in the graph. It's actually bytecode size. And if you've ever had code in production and you've added some assert statements to a small method, 
and then your performance went to shit, it's because of this guy. Because assert statements are actually in the bytecode. And C2 doesn't discount for it if asserts are turned off. I know, embarrassing. I worked on C2 for a very long time. We never fixed it. I'm sorry, you scroll. Um, then there's one called inline small code. That's a really weird one. And it's 2,000 bytes native code size. So if you already have compiled code, let's say from C1, for that method that you want to inline, and the code size is bigger than 2,000 bytes, it's not inlining it. It's kind of the logic behind it is, if it's 2,000 bytes, it's actually pretty big, so we're not going to inline it. But the problem with that one is, if, you've ever ha if you ever ran uh, a benchmark in consecutive runs, and you, you got completely different results, that might be the case. Because it's a race condition in the compilation queues. When a method is hot, you have a hot method that calls another one that you want to inline, they're kind of the they have the same hotness, right? And then if you compile the one first that you want to inline, and then you compile the C2 one, it's not going to inline it. But if the race condition is the other way, if the C2 one gets first, it inlines it. It's stupid. It should get rid of it, but who cares? Same thing, right? You've seen this before. I, I gave it ranges again for the same reason um, that I explained earlier. The thing I did with max inline level, I went from 5 to 20 because I wanted to see what happens if we make it lower. Um, yeah, so let's look at it. 24 hours of tweet service, 30-minute um, evaluation runs. This is the result. Certainly improvements. There's a really big one up here. Um, so we'll see what that looks like in the table. And it looks like this. So the top one is 5.1. And then the next one is 3.8, 3.5, 3.3. So the 5 one kind of feels like a little bit of an outlier. Um, and yeah, at the bottom of the table, looks like this. No constraints violated. I was surprised by that. So, but that's about it. Yeah, not, not much more to say for this one. Chart. Obvious, right? So max inline levels should be higher. It's default 9, and our best result is 16, but I would argue it should be 17 or 18 or something by default, actually. That's what I'm saying, so that the whole world would use it, because this, is like, this graph is ridiculous. Then this guy surprised me, because it's completely flat. It doesn't matter. But I thought max inline size, that should actually make a difference. But in this, at least for the tweet service, it did not. And then this other guy, there was also no impact, which I kind of expected a little bit, but I wanted to see what it does. OK. And yes, I did not do a verification experiment for this one. But you know, let's say the 5 is a little bit of an outlier, and then we have 3.8. So let's say we get a 4% improvement for C2. You know, roughly, which is nice, right? So AutoTune did exactly what it was supposed to do. It tuned even C2, which is a very you know, mature old compiler. It tuned it to get us 4% more, which is great. But compared to what it can do with Graal, it's really nothing. Because if, especially for our code, for the Scala code, we got you know, the tweet service, it was 18 to four. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious for us which compiler we are going to use uh, because it saves us so much money. The summary of my talk, I have the same summary for all of my talks, and that's it. Very complicated. So, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a very good reason why I'm doing all these presentations about Graal. Oracle is not paying me a cent for the, doing this. Um, I get some money from Twitter, that's okay. Uh, the reason why I'm doing all these talks is I want people to try Graal, right? I want you to go to work on Monday, and since you're all running on JDK 11 in production, right? Yes. Um, you just turn it on in production. What could go wrong? Nothing. So, no, but seriously, I, I want you to try it. And the reason why I want you to try it is you've seen what Graal can do, right? It's, it's a, C2 is a very old compiler. It's very complex. It's very hard to understand. 
So we need a newer compiler in OpenJDK where we have more opportunities for optimizations in the future. I mentioned my colleague Flavio earlier. He is working on Scala-specific optimizations. I've worked at Sun and Oracle many years on C2, and not a single day or even a single hour we've ever optimized the JVM or C2 for another language than Java. Never. So there's a lot of opportunity to, to tune for Scala or other languages. Kotlin, maybe. You know, you never know. Um, he has a bunch of optimizations. When he tells me the improvement that he gets, I, I can't believe it. It's like the numbers are outrageous. But there's a lot to do. So I want Graal it, Graal is, on, is already an open JDK, since JDK 10, by the way. So that's why you only have to do that if you run on 10 or later. There's also an 8 version, um, which you can download from the Oracle Labs website. We are, by the way, on 8 as well. We just backported all this stuff. Um, you can just turn it on, right? And I want Graal to become the default compiler in open JDK for sad reasons, right? The whole potential that we have in front of us. The only problem is it's, in, it's a chicken and egg issue, right? Oracle's a very conservative company, so they only want to replace the existing compiler with one that's well-tested, right? But if it's not the default compiler, no one's testing it. So what are we doing? We go to these places and tell you people to please try it. Uh, if you probably, at your company, you have some staging environment, right, where you run stuff before you push it out to production. Try it there. Like, switch it on and see, see what, what happens. Um, you, you might work on a, on a pet project or something. Try it there, really. The smallest, the smallest pieces, things might make a difference. We found, as I said, the talk, uh, the Twitter's quest for a Holy Graal runtime talk, I, I explained all the bugs we found when we started running our services on Graal. And that's already more than two years ago. And since then, we haven't found a single bug, although the code is constantly changing. And then Oracle, you know, they run their tests, but they can only run SpecGBB so many times, and they will not find another bug. So what we want is that you run your shitty production code on Graal. Because that's the weird code, you know, the 20-year-old whatever you have. If you run that and it crashes, that would be amazing. Please file a bug. Go to GitHub, file a bug if that happens. Because then we found something. And, you know, and a, probably a very edge case because we run a lot of stuff on, on Graal. It, it works fine. The tweet service, the social graph service, and about 20 other services, and our biggest services, run on Graal in production 100% for about two years now. We never had an issue. So everything you, you read and write and tweet, goes through co com code compiled by Graal. So we need, we need to find the bugs that are still out there, but we're not finding them right now. And I want you to find it, because then Twitter doesn't go down, and my life's much better. If Twitter goes down, eh, shit, then I, I can't be here. Then I have to do this. Um, then, because I'm a nice person, I want you to save money too, right? Why should only I save money? So it, it might help you to save money in your company. That's, that's also what you have to say when you go to, the ma to your manager on Monday and you say, oh, there was this guy, he was talking about Graal, it's amazing, uh, we should try it. And then your manager will say, well, yeah, you know, um, it runs fine. And then you can say, well, but it runs better. And then you mention the money part, and then the dollar signs will keep rolling in, in his eyes. That's, that's how you can convince him, right? It's never... Uh, you know, it, it's better technology. Managers don't care about this, they care about money. So tell, tell them that. And then, um, we also want to make Graal a better compiler, right? It's still, I've shown you Scala stuff, and I show you Scala stuff because it's, it's really optimizing it well, and we use it, but we also have services that are written in, in Java. We have some Java services that that are substantially that are running substantially better, but we also have some that run with exactly the same performance as C2. It's very difficult. So as I said, C2 was always optimized for Java, right? So, but more importantly, so the JVM C2 is optimized for, for Java code, but more importantly, the code you write in Java is optimized for C2. 
So it's very hard for a new compiler to come in and be better everywhere. You would have to basically change your source code so that it runs better on Graal. You know what I mean? But again, if, if it runs with the same performance, it's still a win, right? Because there's more potential in the future to do optimizations. If it runs slower, could be the case. I've seen benchmarks that actually run slower on Graal than on C2. Uh, let us know if you can. And I know it's difficult with you know, proprietary code. You, you cannot share it, but maybe you can extract a small test case or something. That, that would help, right? These are all the reasons why I'm doing this. Um, yeah, because uh, you know, we reduce, we have, as I said earlier, we have our own data centers. Um, and so we can reduce the, the instance sizes we have of our services. That means less machines, means less electricity, means less cooling in the data center. I'm really trying to save the world here. And with that, everyone has created a Twitter account by now. Take a picture of that, tweet it out. Uh, thank you very much. And I don't know, when did I start? I can, I can probably answer a question or two, like real questions this time. I'm not going to, to pull the same thing again. Anyone got a question? Yes. I think he's coming. Thanks. So I wanted to ask, um, what software did you use to write the machine learning part? Did you just write like your own code, or did you like use a library from Google or something like that? So the machine learning part, it, it, it's it's basically the Bayesian optimization thing. Yes. Yes. That's that's wet lab, the thing okay. I explained earlier. It's like a experiment but modified a little bit better. That, that's it. OK, OK. And the second question is, do you do like other kinds of optimizations to your services? Because what you talked about is like general stuff that just optimizing the parameters from the compiler, you get like a service across uh, optimization. Right. Do you do like per service optimizations? And who tackles that? Like, for example, do you do like, do you analyze the code, the architecture of the code, and after us do right. the optimization? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I believe these like, are, yes. are the biggest ones. Right. I get this question quite a bit. So the question is usually the way it's phrased. You're, you put it very nicely. Usually it's phrased 13% is nothing. If you optimize the source code, you'll get 50. Right? That's kind of the, the question that I usually get. It's true, but we have hundreds of services. And you know, people, they have to do logic. You probably work at a company, you work for a product, and then your managers, they're always pushing for, we need, we need to ship this product, ship this product, ship this product. Do you ever have time to really optimize your source code? Not really. That's the answer. So there, there are two reasons. Yes, optimizing the source code is important. Um, but two things, that what I just said, too many services, for Twitter at least, and then too less people handling the services, uh, and then the code is changing all the time, right? It's constantly changing because you're adding a feature, and then you would have to you know, optimize your code again. So what we do, what I do on the compiler level in the JVM is across the board. It's for all of Twitter, and it's additional. If a service owner decides to optimize his code, he's more than welcome, but I'm just doing what I can do at my level. And the final question, could you give us like a number of how, how much money you, uh, you win by doing this kind of optimization? Is it like one million a day, ten so, millions a month? So the Twitter's quest for Holy Grail runtime, I talk a little bit about this. Um, and I'm not sure if you noticed, but my graphs, they kind of have a y-axis, but it says one point one two three four. I cannot even tell you how much GC cycles we have. Per, you know, I, I'm not allowed to tell you how much money it is. But as I said, it's multiple times more than I get paid. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and we're only running like 20 to 30 services on Graal so far. We haven't rolled it out to everyone yet. So it, it's, it's a huge chunk of money. Thank you. With, with scale, you know, obviously. But I, I give, in this other talk, I give a small, like, like I make up a fictitious company. And then we kind of calculate how much money that would be you could be saving. Just, just watch that part. It's, it's more than you would think. And it's, it's basically, even if your company is small, right, the, 
the data center, the compute expense is still a fraction of your revenue, right? So even if you're small, you're saving some. And then you save $2,000 per year and you could have an awesome Christmas party. Great. Oh, heckling. <laughs> Yeah, no, wait, he first. Oh, no, he's coming. The microphone's coming. I think they, I think they wanted to record it, that's why. Ah, okay. So in your example, when you show there the optimization with Graal and then with Autotune, was it fair to sum up, or it was more like Autotune is on top of what the Graal is already doing, and that it should be like, in, in reality, the optimization is less, so 12, it's not 12, but six, but maybe it's 15. No, no, it's, it's exact, it's fair, yes. Because these runs that I did, it was C2, it was Graal with the default values, and it was Graal with the autotune parameters. It, that, that's the improvement. Uh, okay. So it, it, that's the result. I didn't, you know, f you know make up numbers here. That, that's the, the screenshots you say, you saw, the, the graphs, I it's from our internal monitoring tool. I didn't make these, it's just I took a screenshot of the run. No, I didn't say you were making it. I was only referring to the calculation, the way. So maybe I didn't get it right. Oh, you mean like the 12 plus 6 and something? Yeah, it's not 18. In fact, it's around 16 from the initial CPU. From but auto-tune auto gives you on top of what already Graal gave you. So. so the, so, okay, the answer is, the, the 18 is the actual improvement. I just took the difference between them so I can show it on the slide. But it's actually 18. It, I think that answers the question. Okay, Stefan? Um, so, in the performance testing, do you also play with the garbage collection at all? Or do you stop at just the compilation um, parameters? And right. If you do play with the garbage collection, I mean, Java 13 has just been released last week. There's an experimental new garbage collector there. Do you see there would be any benefits there as well in the general performance uh, results? So the, the auto-tune, the, um, I think that the two talks that Rumkey did, there was one, Devox US, that was already like, what, two years ago or something? And then the other one, I think, was QCon even three or four years ago. So it's, we've been working on this for a while. And it was, we actually started the project, I was not even at Twitter at that point in time. They started the project to tune the GC. That, that was the initial goal. And they did, <clears throat> like one experiment, they presented, I think it's the first video, it's like a, a, a ridiculous improvement, like 50% less GC or something like this. Um, you can tune whatever you want, right? I, I got the question the other day, uh, someone asked me, could I tune my database? Yeah. Of course, Autotune doesn't care. The patient optimization part doesn't care. It's just because I'm a compiler engineer. I, I don't care about the GC. It's, it's boring. <laughs> All right, that was it. You can ask me questions later if you want. Thank you. <laughs>